morning, everyone. Any questions about anything before we start? Nobody has any questions. How about comments? Any comments? <laughs> okay, then we will get started. <clears throat> If you do have questions or comments, feel free to ask them anytime. Interrupt, well, you can raise your hand. So today we're going to talk about writing a literature review and coursework three. So coursework three is writing an abridged literature review. It's not, not what I would call a full literature review, but more like an abridged one. So coursework three will ask you to summarize 10 papers around 10. A full literature review would be more like 20 or maybe 30, something like that. So this is an attempt at me writing down the different dimensions and aspects of writing a survey paper or a literature review in the different stages and, and identifying different stages. It looks, it looks like a linear process. It's not exactly linear, actually. It's more a little bit more iterative than this, but it's presented in a, liter, a more of a linear order. And I tried to describe the stages in terms of preparation, like what do, you, what do you do before you start writing a literature review, and then what do you do when you're writing the literature review. So you have like all of the, the background work before you start writing, and then you have the writing phase. And this, this line, although this line looks very binary. It's not so binary in reality, actually. <clears throat> but uh, it, at least it's helpful to see an organizational structure and be able to look and identify the different stages. And basically, this, this uh, presentation is going to talk about each one of these stages, let's say. So the question is, why do we write literature surveys, right? That's a good question. Right? What is the purpose of a literature review? Why do we talk about this? Why do we learn it? It's, it's the starting point for most research projects. Most research projects start out with a literature review. Well, you could even take a step back and say most projects start out with an idea. Once you have that idea, you need to do a little bit of background research to find out who has worked on this idea already. Right? And the, one of the goals of a literature survey is to, ter is to determine solved and unsolved problems. Like, you may have a solution to a problem. But do you really want to implement that solution to your problem if somebody already did it? Are you, maybe you're just reinventing the wheel? That happens a lot, doesn't it? Reinventing the wheel. I think we all just experienced that just in the past week or two. Sorry about that. Can anybody think of an example that we all just experienced in the past two weeks of reinventing the wheel? Teams, right? I had to switch from like the classic teams to the new teams. That's reinventing, that's an example of reinventing the wheel. Anyways, you may have a solution to a problem, but it turns out that somebody's already solved that problem. So really, it's nicer to work on unsolved problems. And one way we can determine solved and unsolved problems 
is by looking at the previous literature. However, a very large volume of previously literature has been published. So this is one of the reasons that this is difficult. Literature surveys are not easy. Not easy. I'm not going to advertise this as easy. I will advertise it as difficult, actually. A good literature survey is difficult. Yeah. Keeping up with the literature explosion is identified as one of the top challenges in any field. So this has been going on for a long time. You can find references to this problem dating back to 1999 and probably earlier. This is a problem that's been around for a long time and I don't see it disappearing. And it's generally true everywhere. So how can we navigate through this massive complexity and how can we determine unsolved problems to work on? These are two questions that literature reviews in this lecture try to address. So when we, when we write a literature survey, we want to understand what has been published so far on a given topic, right? a given question or a given hypothesis. How have some research papers or studies built on the previous ones? Like how are they connected? Have pathways to future research already been suggested? I mean, the answer is yes, right? When you read the literature, there are going to be suggestions for future work in the literature, right? Unsolved problems. You might, you might ask yourself, how will your survey make a unique contribution? That's not actually a requirement. It's nice, though. Like, there's no requirement that says your survey must make a unique contribution. It, like, you can do a literature survey that's already been done for the purposes of this class and the purposes of your dissertation. However, if you do one that's unique and new, it's very nice, right? It it's, gets higher, more points. Which methodologies have researchers used and which appear the best? And how does your topic fit into the larger context of previous work? And these are all questions that your literature survey tries to address. So the goals, the goals of the literature survey is to try to obtain an overview of the literature and find, identify the solved and unsolved problems. So you have a given topic or a given hypothesis or a given question and you're trying to determine what has been published on this topic already, right? Get an overview. That's the, that's the goal, right? Now, publish it, that's a different goal. If that's not a requirement, but it's fun. So in the visualization group, all the PhD students have to publish a literature survey. And it's, it's so good for their PhDs. Like, anybody, anybody can publish the literature survey, it, but it just takes effort. But anybody can do it. And what we're talking about today is based on experience and reading research uh, literature reviews and writing literature reviews and publishing surveys, right? And of course, supervising supervision experience. So just as a warning, I probably could have put this in italics font. Literature surveys are difficult to write and pose a number of challenges. Right, when you submit your coursework three, you know, your abridged literature survey, none of them are gonna be perfect. None of them, right? And you might even, you're gonna have that feeling, probably, like, oh, this could be better. Like, I'm not sure about this. You're, gonna, you're probably gonna have that feeling when you're working on it and submitting it. Like, I think this could be better. I think it could be improved and so on. It's not easy. Right? And it's, it, the, the perfect literature survey, whew, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure it exists. Of course, you can get ones that are extremely good in quality. 
So what are some of the challenges? Why, did, why is this a difficult exercise? Right. The, the vast amount of previously published literature, this makes this a difficult exercise, right? Because you have billions, trillions of previously published research papers. I actually don't know how many there are. I don't, I don't know if anybody really knows how many there are. But I've read figures of something like 100,000 papers being published every year in computer science or something like this. <laughs> Maybe it's more. Choosing a starting point, very difficult. How do you start? So hopefully at the end of this lecture, you'll have a, a, a feeling for how to start. How to start, where to start. Deciding on a topic. This is also called scope. Like deciding on the scope of your survey. How. How general is it going to be, and how specific is it going to be? Right? How specific should it be? That's a difficult question. Right? I have this topic. I, uh, how specific should my topic be? It's difficult, those, those questions. How to perform the search, the search methodology. We already had a lecture on that, by the way. So we're not actually going to be talking about that. So for coursework one, we had a lecture on how to perform the search. And uh, we, so we won't be talking about that. We might, we'll refer back to it, but we won't talk about that because you already know now how to do it, how to search. How to navigate individual papers, right? You already know how to do that now from coursework one. So coursework one was all about four and five points four and five. Now you're all experts at it, right? The handling it, ha having a single research paper and being able to summarize it and, and extract the essential information. Deriving a classification of the literature, very challenging, and determining unsolved problems, also challenging. So you might have noticed now coursework one and coursework three are tied together. Like Coursework three builds on coursework one. And your dissertation builds on coursework one and three. So it's like a preparation for your dissertations, right? <clears throat> so one of the challenges is choosing a topic or the scope. It's, it's two things, choosing the topic, but then choosing how general that topic should be or how narrow that topic should be. This is a challenging, one of the things that makes the literature survey difficult, right? And this is the preparation phase. This is really the preparation phase. If you think back to that slide and, and the, the mine and the different subtopics. So we have to decide on the scope of a literature survey, which is challenging. Here are some guidelines. This is not a hard science. It's, a, it's really a set of heuristics, like some guidelines about how to do this. Discuss the direction with your supervisor. <laughs> Step one. So when a master's student talks to me, I do not expect them to know the solved and unsolved problems in a given research field. I don't expect them to know that. Why don't I expect them to know that? Two reasons. Because I didn't know what they were when I was a master's student. I remember being a master's student, even though it was five million years ago. I remember it very well. And we don't teach it. So those are two good reasons. So guideline number two is choose a scope that you think is too narrow to start with. So think of something very narrow and, and focus on that. It's much easier to take something that's too narrow in the beginning and then broaden it than to take something that's too broad and narrow it. So the, taking a subject that's too broad is a very common error. Right? I'm going to write a literature review of artificial intelligence. Too broad. 
I'm going to write a literature review of machine learning, too broad. Right? I'm going to learn. Uh, I'm going to write a literature review of uh, neural networks, too broad. Right. I'm going to write a, 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 a literature review of neural networks applied to uh, something very, very specific, like. I can't think of a good example, but uh, data sets data sets on on diets. That that could be good. That might be a narrow enough scope. Right? Dietary data sets. I'm going to apply machine learning to dietary data sets to study diets, diet uh, you know trends. That might that's that's an idea that that's a an example of something that might be narrow enough. Might be, but start very narrow. Right. Guideline number three is do a preliminary search. How many papers are you finding on your chosen topic? Right. If you find too many, then your scope is too broad. Right. If you're finding something like uh, hundreds of research papers on your topic, it's too broad. Right, you know how to do the search already, right? Because you did it already for coursework one. We talked about that, how to do the literature search. You know, if you uh, if you find too many, so aim f aim for ten papers. So imagine you do a search and you find ten papers on your topic. That's perfect. Like that's a good scope, really good scope. That that would be like almost perfect, like ideal, right? So that's if you want to find only ten papers on your topic, it has to be very narrow, really narrow. Yeah. Another guideline: don't forget to search for existing surveys. So chances are, when you have a topic, there is a survey or a literature review that already exists. There's a good chance of that, or something very closely related. It might not be exactly a topic, but something closely related. So don't forget that. And then you include a description of your survey scope in the introduction, right? There's a section in your literature survey called scope. This is what my literature survey covers, what it includes and what it does not include, right? So you're trying to define those boundaries between like what's inside and what's outside. And remember, we had the search process, right? There it is, finding the relevant research papers. You already know how to do the search process. So that's what I'm talking about when you're searching. Right. You can, as a, as a quick test, you can go to Google Scholar and search for your topic and see how many matches you get. Right. And you'd have to look at the matches, though. Like, you can't just look at the number. You have to actually look at the titles and the abstracts to see if you're getting matches. And if, you're, if your matches are confined to the first one to two pages of Google Scholar, that's good. But if you find that you're getting matches on pages three, four, five, and six, it means your scope is too broad. Right? And if you're not sure, by the way, you can ask me. You can ask me, like, hey, I have this idea for a scope. Is this good? But who should you also, who should you also be asking? Exactly, exactly. So one of the goals of coursework three is to actually start working on your dissertation. You want the literature review from this module to overlap with your dissertation. Otherwise, you have to do it over again starting from scratch for your dissertation. You may as well start it now, have it exactly overlap. You'll be happier, and your supervisor will be happier too, right? Because you've already like, gotten started. Yeah. So that's one of the intentions. 
and that's also like the, the timing seems to have worked out quite well too, right? So we released the list of supervisors at, at the beginning of, oh, well, at the beginning of the month, everybody's searching for a supervisor during the month, and now we're here at the end of the month saying, boom, time to start this literature survey that coincides with your supervisor. So survey contributions, you can write you can write your literature review as if it is going to make contributions and you're going to publish it. It's not a requirement, but we want to formulate it like this. You want to say that your literature review is making some contributions. So typical contributions could be it's the first literature survey of a given topic T. Right, something that you've chosen to get into your survey. You might be the first person writing a, a survey or a literature review on that topic. Usually, you can find a topic and be the first person if it's if it's narrow. Right, the more narrow it is, the more likely you can be the first person. The more broad it is, the less likely you are to be the first. You can introduce a novel classification of the literature. So what we mean is that, that we're going to talk about this further, but we want to put papers that are similar to each other in the same category. We want to introduce categories, and then we want to put papers that are similar in the same category. And we have maybe three or four categories, and that's called a classification, a literature classification. And it can serve as a valuable starting point. You can think of it as serving as a valuable starting point to a new topic. So anybody that's interested in that topic can look at your literature survey and get an introduction to the topic. By the way, a lot of literature surveys are updated versions of previous ones. So sometimes you have a topic, you find a survey on that topic or a literature review, but it's old. It's 10 or more years old. Well, you can republish it. You can bring it up to date and republish it. That happens pretty frequently. A, 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 a set of a, 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 an obscure trivia, it's not that obscure, but some trivia is the most highly cited paper in all of physics. It has like 20 gazillion citations is a survey paper and it's published every, I don't know, five to ten years or something. They just take the existing survey, they bring it up to date and they republish it. And it's, 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 it might be the most highly cited in the world, I'm not sure. But that's um, a common strategy or, or it can be, maybe it's not a common strategy, but it's a strategy that, that, that works, so it can work. <clears throat> so identifying research field challenges, this is another thing that you have discussed in your literature survey. So for every topic there are a typical set of challenges to overcome. Right now all the hype is artificial intelligence. Well what's one of the challenges associated with artificial intelligence? It's, it's accuracy. Right, trying to, to increase the accuracy of a given process or algorithm. Right, this is one of the this is what we're talking about when you say research field challenges. So in the writing phase of the survey, you discuss the challenges associated with research conducted on your given topic. And I'll just these are some very generic, common examples of those challenges. The size and complexity of data, right? This is a challenge and a, a trend that's been going on forever. Well, forever, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but since computers have been invented, right? As the hardware gets better, the data set sizes they produce gets larger, and then our ability to understand them decreases, right? 
and there's a gap between what we can understand and the size of the data sets. So very, very common challenge, right? The size and complexity of the data. Heter heterogeneous data, so data that's coming from multiple sources or has different kinds of characteristics, like some, some of it's qualitative, some of it's quantitative, and trying to merge them in a sensible way. Errors and uncertainty associated with data and processes, like for example, artificial intelligence. All measured data contains error and uncertainty. Right? All observational data contains error and uncertainty. Very common challenge. <coughs> the cost associated with conducting experiments or developing software or buying expensive equipment very, very common challenges, right? And the limitations of existing hardware and software, right? All given an existing hardware and software has limitations, like it could be the size of the data set that they can process, right? There's a, always a maximum size before they can't function anymore, right? There's always a maximum speed, too, right? You can never have uh, like unlimited speed. So those are some uh, limitations of this existing hardware and software. These are very generic. You can take these very generic though and make them very specific to your specific topic. Like you can literally take these and rewrite them to be more specific for your given topic. Right? Because they, they apply almost universally. By the way, you will also see these research field challenges discussed in the literature that you review. You'll see these mentioned. Anybody know where you see these mentioned? That's an advanced question. You'd have to be pretty on the ball to answer that question. But you do you have, you have seen this from coursework one because you've looked at research papers and you know that they all mention the research field challenges. It's just a question of do you remember where? Introduction, yes. The first paragraph of the introduction always starts out with these challenges. Yeah. Yep, and it's also called motivation like the introduction should be called motivation. It shouldn't be called introduction. If you think about it, introduction is not a useful word. Not really. Like, what does that tell you? Motivation is a, use of, a useful word. Right? Motivation answers the question of why. Like, why is this important? Why are we working on this? Right? And the research field challenges are very closely tied to the why why is this important? Why are we working on it? What, what, why is this uh, a solution we're proposing? So this is a literature classification. This is from a, a literature survey. And this is the literature survey, by the way. These, these rectangles are all papers, research papers. So there's one, there's another one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And they're put into different categories. The categorization in this case is, is actually, uh, it's three-dimensional, actually. It's four-dimensional, actually. So what are the dimensions? The first dimension is the, is the topic so this is for the physical sciences. So these are the different physical sciences included in the, in the along one axis. So all of these papers address astronomy, all of these address chemistry, all of these address earth sciences and physics, right? Along the y-axis is the spatial dimensionality of the input data. Right, the input data has a special spatial dimensionality, could be two-dimensional, could be three-dimensional. That's another uh, dimension. 
But a third dimension is the temporal dimension of the data. Static means time independent, so there's no time change, no cha change in time. And then we have time dependent, so the, the data is changing over time. <clears throat> right? That's the third dimension. Anybody know what the fourth dimension is? <laughs> it's kind of funny to, to uh, think of a four-dimensional classification table. This is a very advanced one, by the way. You're not required to have a classification that's four-dimensional like this. It's very advanced. The fourth, the fourth dimension is color, right? They all have a color, each paper. Right, and the colors are assigned to the main field challenges addressed by each paper. So we just talked about research field challenges, right? So there's color mapping there, multi-field visualization, graphics hardware, feature detection, scalable viz, time dependent visualization, uncertainty error, and global versus local visualization, comparative visualization. So that's four-dimensional. That's just an example of a literature classification. It's a very polished and advanced one. It's not required for coursework three. It just gives you an idea of what we're talking about. So one of the things you're going to try to do for coursework three in your dissertation is this classification. Is this easy? No, it's not easy. I'm not advertising it as easy. We talked about this classification for a long time. This is the end result of six to 12 months of discussions, right? So that was not a quick thing, it's not a quick thing. So this is part of the preparation and the writing. It doesn't really fall super clean into preparation or writing, but it's both the preparation and the writing. So you try to derive a literature classification for your papers. So the classification categorizes each research paper such that similar papers fall into the same group. Deriving groups, categories, and dimensions for your classification requires <coughs> some thought. So what could you do about this? Any ideas what you could do about this? about if you wanted to figure out a classification? Anybody have any ideas? <coughs> exactly, nice. Talk about it with your supervisor. Your supervisor, I, it would be really interesting to take a survey in this class and say, okay, you asked your supervisor this question, how should I, what topic should I choose for my literature survey and how, how should I classify the papers? and see what the responses are. Like, that would be an interesting survey itself. Like, you know, maybe that should be part of the coursework. Maybe, maybe I'll modify that, yeah. <clears throat> so, but, so if you didn't just, if you were not able to just ask your supervisor, some guidelines could include you try to identify subtopics and reoccurring themes data or metadata attributes. Remember those input data characteristics? Right? Those, those are a classification dimension. You can use those to classify your papers. Like this set of papers handle, handles static data, and this set of papers handles time-dependent data. Right? Or this set of paper handles, handles black and white images only, and this set of papers handles color images, or this set of papers handles low resolution images, maybe 256 squared, and this set of papers can handle any arbitrary resolution, like 1024 squared and 4096 squared and so on. What are some of the themes or subtopics that reoccur over and over again? These are natural categories. Right. Are there any natural sub -ba subject based clusters? A tool called surveys can help with this. So you'll, you'll, a you'll actually be asked to test out this tool for coursework three. What are some of the characteristics that most of 
most, if not all, of the papers you search have in common, right? So data characteristics are a very common categorization dimension. The type of evaluation is also very common as a classification. Like here are all the, the papers on this topic that use a controlled user study for their evaluation. Or here are all the papers on this given topic that use accuracy as the evaluation metric for in, in, in the evaluation. So that's a very common classification for the dimension uh, for the for the papers. Here's another example. Again, this is three-dimensional, right? So here are the papers. On the x-axis is, is uh, the dimensionality of the resulting graphics. So 2D surfaces, 3D particles, 3D rendering and placement surfaces, volumes. Right, this is, the, this is the dimensionality of the output, actually, not the input data, the output. This is the dimensionality of the input data. So that's the second dimension. And then the third dimension is color, again. So you, like I said, you're not required to have a three-dimensional classification. It just shows you some examples to give you some idea. And there are more than 10 papers, right, in this one. That's because it's a full literature survey, not an abridged one. You're asked for 10. <clears throat> and so red is for seeding strategies, green is for techniques addressing perceptual challenges, and yellow are for methods aimed at improving application performance, right? So three different kinds of goals. Those are really goals, goals of the research. And that's the actual paper. Now, the, 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 it also asks you for a metadata example image. So some image or diagram that shows you some information about the literature you're talking about. Maybe it could be an organizational diagram. Uh, in this case, there, there are lots of choices, so I won't, I won't go into lots of details about this. This is just one example. This is an example that shows how the research papers are related to one another. It's the connection of how they're related to one another. So it's a diagram that shows, like, this one is related to this one. This is the child, and here's the parent, right? This is a research paper, and then these are all children of this one. In other words, when you look at the related work section of this paper, and you identify that one core related work, it points back to this one. Remember that, that objective core related work? A lot of people in this, in this class struggled with that section, by the way, the core related work section. And then this one has a child that points back to, to this one, and so on. So they all are, it shows the relationship between the different research papers. Each node in this tree is a research paper and it's showing its child and its parent relationship. It's showing other things. This is the, this is the dimensionality of the input data, actually. So two-dimensional, 2.5D means surfaces, 3D means volumes. And then this, this means unsteady data. So this paper right here is handling 2D data that's unsteady, so time dependent. That's, that means time dependent. And this paper is handing, handling volumetric data that is time dependent. So the LIC hierarchy of related research, right? 
So that's just an example of a diagram that you, you include in, in coursework three. It doesn't have to be this diagram. It's, there are lots of different examples. You'll see examples in the coursework itself as well. But you, you want to include one diagram, like something, a metadata diagram, call it. So this is what it looks like. This is an outline of your literature review, right? The outline of your survey could look like the following. You know I love templates. I love templates. I think I made that announcement in the very first lecture. Love templates. This is a template. So coursework one, you had a template. Coursework two, you have a template to follow. <laughs> In coursework three, you have a template. Templates are great, right? Because they provide a structure. They're systematic, so you can apply that structure over and over again, and they're easy to assess. <laughs> but templates are really, really great. They're really, really great, and they're everywhere if you look out for them. So your, your literature survey coursework three will have an introduction and motivation, including contributions. It will discuss the research field challenges. It will discuss your scope, like how narrow it is or how wide it is. It will discuss how you searched for your papers. How did you do your search? And, and uh, what did you include and what didn't you include? That's the topic we already covered coursework one. You'll discuss your classification of the literature and how it's organized. You'll include a metadata example, a diagram. Right? That's all in section one. And then section two will include the paper summaries. So you have a subsection of papers according to category A and a subsection of papers according to category B and so on. So you're performing that, that research paper summary from coursework one. Now you're applying it to the, to the literature survey. Does that make any sense, hopefully? We can look at it. Those are the survey papers referenced. We can look at it uh, briefly. So coursework three, it's online, right? It's on Moodle, May 17th. Uh, there's the description, summarizing research papers, extra help, categorization, right? You categorize your papers, extra help on a categorization. The literature browser, you're required to, to use this literature browser, right? That this is something you build, it's a web page you build, and it includes all your papers. The supplementary figures, right, there's a, meta, there's a metadata example, the list of references, and there's the template, right? The title of the literature review, including the topic, name, student number, the following is the outline of how your literature review is organized, introduction, Research field challenges, survey scope, search methodology, classification of literature, then the paper summaries with the sub different subsections. Yeah. And then the references. Any questions about that? Yeah. So that's the template. Sound like fun? It's not easy. I'm not going to advertise this as easy. Literature surveys are difficult. It's already difficult just trying to start. Like, oh my gosh, how am I going to start this? Uh, the more you talk to your supervisor, though, the easier it will be, I, would, I guess. And, and uh, yeah, any questions, comments? Okay, if everybody's happy, you're free to go.
if you're unhappy, you can stay and talk to me until you are happy. Thank you.